Hey, welcome back to the DevSecOps track at the DevOps Online uh, Summit. Today I'm here with Sebi, uh, and, and Sebi's going to talk about machine, lo- machine learning ops and the security associated with machine learning ops. He works at the SAS Institute uh, over in France. He's done previous work in Paris at a data the startup, again working as a data scientist, holds an engineering degree from uh, Supelec, France, and also a master's of science specializing in machine learning uh, from George Tech. Uh, we normally, when we talk about DevOps, we have a hard time integrating that to MLOps flow, uh, but it's not really as far apart as you think, especially when you consider security. So Sebi's going to give us a good introduction to that and kind of talk about some of the threats you should worry about with your MLOps pipeline. Uh, Sebi, go ahead and take over. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for having me today here to, to talk about MLOps. So it's an exciting subject, and I'm happy uh, to share this subject with you. Yeah, so if we starts by the beginnings of uh, maybe machine learning uh, in production. So it started about 20 years ago. Um, There was uh, the big tech giants starting to collect and gather a lot of data. And that's where we started using these machine learning techniques in, in, uh, in the business and in production. But in the last several years, so this technology is being adopted more and more by, by other companies and other industries. So uh, we're seeing more and more application in other, um, other industries like in healthcare, in manufacturing, banking and insurance, for example. And we're starting to have more and more machine learning model in production. So, so are we seeing... I'm going to start right away, right? So we get the, the back and forth. Are we seeing more because it's getting better or because it's getting easier to use? Actually, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of um, s- several factors there. So uh, it's because we have more data. It's uh, because we have better compute. And it's because, of course, we have um, more tools. And in the last years, actually, companies started investing in big data infrastructure. They started recruiting uh, data talents, the data scientists. So it's all these factors that, uh, the, that give us these results of having uh, finally more machine learning used in production. And what we're starting to, uh, to see now is a new need in order to optimize what we're doing because uh, we're seeing that we need maybe um, a better approach in order to, to optimize how we serve this, uh, these models in production. Um, we need to monitor this model. We need to, uh, to uh, keep this model updated during time. And that's the subject of uh, MLOps uh, at the end. So, with, um, when we start to have more models um, in production, we also starting to have um, more models integrated into uh, critical decision uh, systems and to uh, sensitive decision-making uh, systems as well. Um, so this kind of system, it's, it can be, uh, for example, in, uh, use cases for um, uh, health diagnosis, for credit scoring, uh, for uh, recruiting. Um, and for these use cases, if we make an error, an error could have a huge impact on our lives, actually. So that's why we also starting to hear about responsible AI. So responsible AI is not only focusing on the accuracy of a machine learning model, but also looking to other subjects like uh, uh, can we explain these models? Uh, looking into uh, the biases of this model, our, uh, our, our model bias towards a specific uh, social group, for example. And also uh, our subject today, uh, we talk about the privacy and the security of these uh, machine learning um, models. So this, the uh, same thing we yeah, balance so, in our DevOps, yeah. right, as we move forward, that it's kind of a, the, between transparency and security, that you need everything to be transparent, but you still need to be the data secure at the end of the day. Yes, uh, it's uh, actually the, um, the MLOps practices are, of course, um, uh, inspired from, uh, from the de- DevOps uh, practices. 
but I think that there are um, some main difference between uh, between the two, uh, because mach actually machine learning software is uh, complex um, software uh, software uh, software code, and there are some specificities in in uh, machine learning projects uh, that we don't have in standard software software engineering. I think the, the first one, the main one, is uh, the need for ex experimentation. Yeah? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Do you have a question? No, I was going to have you move on to the, uh, yeah. your slides as, as we're going through. Yeah, uh, so, right. Yeah, so if we talk about MLOps, uh, the first part I was talking about is uh, experimentation. Um, yep. So um, actually, when we when we start a machine learning project, we do we do a lot of um, trials and tests. We try a lot of different things in um, how how we prepare our data. Uh, we try different machine learning uh, algorithms with different architectures, uh, and we play with the parameters and hyperparameters in order to, to find uh, the, the best model. And uh, usually. Uh, what data scientists uh, use is uh, notebooks, uh, and um, most of the times on the laptops. So actually, there are a lot of things that violate uh, good software uh, engineering practices. Uh, so, so that's why we did, we did actually the, the DevOps principles applied to machine learning uh, for a continuous integration and um, continuous develop development, but with keeping in mind this experimentation in order to uh, to ensure that we we have this uh, this um, this experimentation part so i'm going to go to the uh, mlos principles in with machine learning there is yeah i was gonna say with machine uh, learning you're kind of doing both sides at the same time right because you're you're cleaning the data and making the data fit and streaming it into the the bulk you need to get rid of outliers and those type of things. At the same time, you're trying to train a model to interpret that data. Is that correct? Is that kind of the? Yeah, of course. Uh, working on the data is, uh, is really important um, when when we talk um, about about MLOps. It's, it's it's one pillar, I think, uh, of, um, of of MLOps uh, to to have the good data at the right time. Uh, and actually, uh, this is maybe the second uh, reason why we need MLOps is that the output of uh, a mach machine learning project is actually code plus a model. In, uh, if, uh, if we compare that to, uh, to, uh, to software engineering, we deliver code, but in uh, machine learning engineering, we deliver code and a model. And the model is a piece of software that depends on a snapshot of data. And as we know, data uh, is uh, forever changing. So uh, data evolves. And this means that over time, our model is going to, to be less relevant and its performance is going to degrade. We call this concept drift. And it's specific uh, to, to, to machine learning. So, what we come up with is the uh, actually how can we monitor this model over time, and we we have to 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 have the the right tools to to retrain our model regularly, and that's uh, what we call continuous training. So uh, in MLOps we add this uh, third uh, concept, which is this uh, this continuous training in order to keep um, our model alive. And uh, and uh, ensure that we have uh, a good performance. I tell you what, as a security guy, continuous validating and continuous monitoring is right up my alley. I'm all for uh, seeing everything as much yeah, as possible so, and spitting it out. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in, in the last part, it's uh, of course we need a lot of test and uh, validation. So. Actually, this includes um, some technical monitoring, like um, monitoring that uh, we have um, a good response time for, uh, for our model, that uh, we are, um, our model is um, available. 
uh, but it also includes some uh, more mathematical monitoring, uh, like monitoring the performance uh, of the model over time. And uh, for the tests and validation, it includes uh, testing for bias uh, and also uh, ensuring uh, the, the security. Uh, so we talked about uh, this part. Uh, so we're having now this machine learning um, integrated in a critical decision, uh, such as uh, autonomous vehicle, uh, deciding if we're getting a credit uh, uh, or not um, for fake news uh, detection as well. And these errors can lead to negative impact. And that's why uh, the, the security is, um, is, is really uh, important. You know, one of the negative impacts, you listed some personal ones there that kind of affect you as an individual. Uh, we've had a lot of talks about how machine learning in like face recognition or in pattern recognition that police departments are using can be uh, have some serious negative impacts on your life as well. Yeah, uh, so uh, this this comes also to the the part of uh, the the ethics um, behind uh, machine learning, but this yeah this is um, another subject because uh, yeah it, yeah it depends on on uh, different persons, but we have to, to ensure that it's a, it's a powerful technology. But we have to, to ensure that we're using it uh, for, for, for good purposes. So tell us how they can break it. <laughs> tell us how people are already out there yeah. looking for ways to, to, to stop our system. From yeah, so when we, when we start to talk about uh, security of, um, of uh, machine learning models, actually, um, Considering that uh, machine learning software is um, complex uh, software uh, code, these systems are going first to be vulnerable to um, the, the same, I, I would say, um, vulnerabilities as, uh, as uh, our, um, our software, uh, like uh, computer security related to infrastructure, to network, to, to access rights. But we're going to have another another set of threats, and these threats this time are built in in our models, and they are more data related. So that's why I think that it's really important that we have this uh, conversation today because we need to be aware of that. Today is more a research subject, so we have a lot of researchers actually um, uh, working on these subjects, um, trying to detect uh, which are, which are these, uh, these threats, uh, designing attacks to, uh, to, uh, to, to see how we can uh, impact these models, other designing defenses, and other designing other attacks to break these defenses. So it's an active research area. But for us, uh, data scientists uh, working in the field and putting uh, models in production, we need to be more aware of these threats um, in order to, to, to have the good practices when we design our, our machine learning systems. So for machine learning systems, we have um, different kinds of threats. I, I like to, to classify these threats into four types. First one is data extractions. It means that just by exposing our model, somebody can extract yes, uh, some parts of our training data, the data that was used to train the model. Second one is model stealing, the ability to copy a model um, or, um, and, and to steal its, its type and parameters. Third one and the fourth one, the idea is actually uh, making your model uh, give false predictions uh, so uh, a false output. Uh, the first one is by tricking your model by by changing something in the in the input that that we uh, give to the model. The second one is actually corrupting your model, so modifying your, your model in some way so that it gives uh, this um, this this false prediction. So 
we're going to to go more into details for each one of these threads um, um, if you agree with this so let's take the this first thread so it's um, uh, uh, data extraction so uh, I'm going to just go back to explain one thing. So in machine learning systems, we have two main uh, steps. First step is training our model. So starting from the data, we're going to train a machine learning model uh, and machine learning algorithm on this data, which is going to give us our model. So this is a trained model. Once this model is ready, we're going to serve it, to put it in production. And this served model is going to be like a black box where I can have some queries to, uh, to, uh, to, put, uh, to give new data to this model. And I get back the prediction or the output. So for data extraction, we're going to focus on this phase, on the inference phase. Now, th this may be the wrong section, but does that model change once you put it in production? Uh, I mean, we talk about the software capabilities. We talk about uh, you know using immutable containers uh, from a security perspective so that it doesn't change. But if you're adding new data to the model, does the model actually change as it gets that new data? Actually, here in on the inference phase, it doesn't change. So it's it's like um, it's like a service. Where I have, uh, I can have some API, API calls, and it gives me back a result. Very good. So it it does not impact uh, the model in this in this part. So we assume that the training data, the model type, and parameters are hidden, and we expose a black box. But actually, what researchers have shown is that by doing a lot of these requests. So querying this model number of time um, and each time getting back the results, we are able to extract parts of the training data. So this is really a data leakage problem. And um, one example of this, for example, is um, face, face detection uh, algorithms. So we have a face detection algorithms trained on um, different faces in order to, uh, to, de to detect who is the person in the photo. And if we do a lot of queries to this exposed model, some re researchers were able to reconstruct a specific photo of you or me, for example. So, so this is, this is something that we don't have in other software systems, but it's because actually our, our model was trained on some specific data. So it's, it contains in, in some way this information and somebody with uh, enough knowledge who's able to reverse engineer this, this, this model in some way uh, is able to reconstru uh, reconstruct part of the data. So, we see this problem mainly in, um, in large models, so like, uh, like computer vision models, but also in, um, in um, large language models. Uh, so there is another example uh, on, on textual data. So this actually, um, um, uh, you, you maybe heard about uh, GPT-3, which, um, which was um, uh, advertised a lot uh, in the press, press, which is a very large model trained on, um, on uh, a lot of data from the internet, uh, like uh, Wikipedia pages, uh, uh, GitHub uh, public code, and a lot of other websites. Um, so GPT-2 is the predecessor, which is also a large model, and, which was, uh, and it was published by OpenAI. The, um, Artificial Intelligence uh, Research Lab. And what researchers have shown is that by giving some specific queries to this model, they were able to extract personal information, like the name of uh, a person, the email address, the phone number, the fax number, and the, the address. So 
actually the small will become so much large that they are, they generalize generalize less and they start to memorize and that's the problem so this model in order to optimize the accuracy accuracy they start to memorize some specific information and that's what makes finally this this, uh, this model able to uh, to, uh, to to give back um, this data uh, at query time for people who know how to to reverse engineer finally this uh, this requests fascinating that's crazy uh, yeah <laughs> and it doesn't stop here <laughs> yeah so there is another example where um, here we don't extract specific uh, information. But we are also, we're just able to say here, and this works with, uh, with uh, other standard uh, model, we're, we're able to say if a training example that we give as, a, as an input to, uh, to a machine learning model, if it was in the training data or not. For example, I can say, uh, okay, uh, uh, is, um, was uh, Mark Peters part of this uh, study? I can have the information if yes or no, uh, you, you were part of this study. So this, uh, this is another example. Yeah, I, I... So yeah, so this is actually uh, um, uh, here in, in this part of security, it's also a privacy uh, issue. And uh, we're starting to have um, a lot of thoughts um, and, and research in this area. I see a legal application for that as well. And I probably shouldn't that the lawyers come back and say, you said you were using this model, but you were negligent because this model did not include a set of people or a, you know, properties that you should have included uh, when you went forward and did your thing. Yeah, uh, if there are, yeah, it's, uh, there are a lot of uh, legal issue uh, in this. Uh, and actually, if I go back to the previous example, um, here, some people uh, would argue that, uh, okay, uh, but, but this data that we have here in the model, it was public in the first place. That was, uh, that's why it was included in this model, because it was uh, public information that was available uh, on the internet. But actually, uh, in Europe, uh, we have what you call the GDPR. And uh, what the GDPR states is that data should be used for a specific purpose. So here we're using it out of its context. Okay. So we we so so when when this uh, the, the the this person agreed to 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 put its data uh, public, it was for a specific purpose, and it was not so that it could be trained uh, in in this in this uh, in this model. So this can pose also some. Uh, some I think you can answer that that was a specific purpose that the data was being used for. They made it public and that public data can be used for other purposes. I mean, if you called them up and had a question about their business, right, that would be fitting the specific purpose. I don't know. Many questions. Yeah, so, so that's why there, there is a lot of questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's it for this first thread uh, about uh, data, data extraction. Um, and if we go to the second thread, actually, by adopting the exact same um, uh, strategy, so um, an attacker querying a model and getting back some results, we're also able to steal the model. So uh, either by um, uh, either by um, uh, going back to uh, the, the, the type of model of its parameter or just by copying this model in some way. Um, there are some methods uh, called uh, distillation uh, methods who, uh, who, who are able to do this, this kind of things uh, just by querying uh, a black box model. So this can also, uh, of course, uh, pose some problems for, um, for uh, services out there um, based on uh, machine learning uh, models. Let's take, for example, um, um, a translation service. Uh, let's say that there is a, a paid service uh, to do translation based on a very good uh, machine learning model. Well, if an attacker is able to, to copy the model, uh, 
uh, user can start to uh, to use uh, this model without paying the service, and uh, we're going potentially to have other competitors uh, arising. So this is also something that we need to, to be uh, aware of, and it's specific to to, to machine learning models. Um, should we go to the the next uh, thread, yeah, maybe? For sure. Yeah. Okay. So the third threat is uh, what we call model tricking. So the idea is that by manipulating in some way the input that I give uh, to, uh, to a model, I'm able to make this model output a uh, wrong prediction. So I have an example here of an image of a cat. We we both see a cat, I hope. But actually, this model classifies this as guacamole. It's a little more hair so than I like in my guacamole. Thing is, <laughs> <laughs> thing is, what happens there is that an attacker just switch some pixels in this photo. It's something that we, we cannot see directly. Uh, looking at this photo, but for uh, for machine learning algorithms, this is now another thing. He sees uh, he, he doesn't see the cat anymore, and he chooses to classify to give another class for for this um, for this cat. I know they were advertising. I think it's the same thing for a while that you could buy like a little swirly disc that looked like a tie dye, like a sticker or something. You could put it on a backpack or a jacket. Uh, they would make it so that the cameras couldn't see you effectively or couldn't ID you even if they saw you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, there are also other examples using, uh, using these techniques like um, putting some, um, some glasses with uh, some patterns and it makes a face recognition uh, algorithm recognize another person, for example. Um, uh, there, there was a lot of question also about uh, autonomous vehicles uh, in this uh, in this part, because uh, if we think about it, um, uh, autonomous um, cars, for example, use computer vision to, to make sense of their environment, and some researcher, researchers have shown that just by changing, um, uh, doing this attack, but on a photo that is displayed on a billboard, for example they're able to make the car think that there is a stop sign there or uh, maybe a sign that there is uh, no more speed limitations. So this raises also uh, some, uh, some, some, some questions about uh, the security of, of this system in this, uh, in this context. You know, we used to live in Germany. I can see the use for one of these patches on my license plate as we go by those speed cameras all the time. <laughs> I could probably make some good use of a yeah, 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 exactly. Those model so, tricking uh, systems. <laughs> yeah, so the, the first uh, generation of these uh, radar systems, uh, they, uh, they were not using uh, um, machine learning, but I think that uh, this technology is getting uh, more and more integrated in these systems. And uh, that's why well, we, we need to be aware of the security uh, threats. And you say cars, but even in retail and places like that, they're trying to go to more autonomous systems, right? Where they, you can go and pick your stuff out and you never have to deal with a, an individual yeah. or a teller when you check out. Uh, so even able to disguise your purchases or hide those type of things. Yes, yes. Um, yes, it's, it's, I think it's really good Broadly that applicable. we're starting to, yeah, to, yeah. to have, to have this, uh, this uh, amazing technology applied um, in a lot of areas, but uh, the idea well, is that I have to if, say, if we if we work uh, in designing some some of these systems, we need to be aware of, uh, of these threats and that. In an old time call out, do you remember the Captain Crunch whistle stories for hackers? Uh, I'm not I'm not aware of uh, there was a a whistle and it came in a box of cereal as the free prize for kids. Uh, and it made the same tone that the phone company was using to initiate its long distance service. So if you would dial the phone and you would blow the whistle, it would think that you had approved long distance service uh, to go through okay. whoever it was. Right? Yeah, yeah. 
So, yeah. An old example, but it has to go back to the, the, the hacker origins, right? Yeah, and uh, actually, this this kind of this kind of um, attacks are also used uh, in uh, audio systems. Like uh, like here, you you see something, but there is something hidden inside. It it works also with uh, with uh, voice and uh, uh, like you hear something, and actually the message is saying another thing uh, uh, for, to the mother. Right, the so. stenography. Is that uh, it? Putting a no, picture inside no, of a picture. It's... Actually, it's uh, this is called the adversarial attacks. So uh, ah, okay, uh, it's uh, adversarial examples uh, in order to to, to make uh, this this kind of uh, this kind of attacks. Uh, so let me maybe just go to to our last threat, um, which is uh, model corruption. So now we're going to look at uh, at our. Um, Training training phase. So here we are training our model, and here we're uh, we're uh, serving it. So actually, uh, when in, in a lot of projects uh, where um, uh, um, on which uh, I have worked, um, uh, what we're trying to to achieve is uh, because the power of uh, machine learning is that we're able to make sense of a lot of data. So what we try to do is uh, try to go fetch a lot of external data. Uh, so from, uh, from, uh, from the web, for example, in order to improve uh, our model, like uh, going to, uh, to fetch uh, weather data, stock market data. Um, it can be uh, scrapping some, uh, some forums, uh, some uh, information from social media with sentiment analysis. So a lot of um, uh, kind of things. So all this data, uh, is, is used as training data to train our algorithms. And in, in the beginning um, uh, of, of this uh, talk, we talked about continuous training. So if you want to make our model um, to ensure its performance, performance over time, we have to do this uh, training part regularly. So we have to automate how we're going to fetch this data, so fetch it automatically, for example, uh, every month, uh, in order to retrain a model and serve um, a, a good model uh, at every moment. So here we can easily see that uh, an attacker could actually just go and manipulate this public data. So let's say, uh, for example, a, 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 a social media feed uh, that, uh, that I'm scrapping regularly. Uh, we can imagine uh, one attacker or a bunch of attackers or bots uh, putting a lot of wrong messages or uh, um, fake comments uh, on a product or something like that. And this actually uh, is going to be fed to our model uh, and this is, we're going to have a corrupted model that's going to be served. And that's an attack that we call data poisoning. And actually, I think that, yeah, this is something that most of the data scientists uh, using these models today, we're, we're not that aware of, of this because we're aiming to have the best performance possible. So we're going to, to fetch the data where we find it but we don't pay um, maybe sufficient at attention to, uh, to the sources of this data. And uh, we, I, I think my main message here is just be aware of this when you, uh, when you construct your model, especially if you are building a critical decision uh, system. So um, this is uh, one example, uh, yeah. Uh, you probably have the example. I said, I, I remember a story a, a year or two back that there were some graduate students and they were working with a machine learning model. Uh, they were supposed to do customer service uh, and they taught it to swear uh, so that every time it would respond to somebody, it would use uh, horrible comments and swear at them and call them all kinds of nasty racist names. And <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. They had to scrap it and go back and start all over again, right? Yeah, the, this is the kind of problem that uh, that that you can have uh, with uh, with this system because we we saw uh, several examples of this uh, 
all the data on the internet uh, can be can be manipulated actually and uh, same thing that um, for for uh, computer systems we have um, the denial of service attacks like a bunch of uh, requests on some servers to uh, to deny the the access to the server we can have maybe the the, the equivalent here for machine learning models with a bunch of attackers uh, manipulating one uh, data source in order to to make it uh, false and uh, corrupt some potential uh, models that are trained on this data. Well, these actually lead to your your generative adversarial networks as well, right? Where you you point a model at another model and try to get the model to convince the other model that something different is going on. Uh, like when you design yeah. one model to paint and the other model to recognize whether or not it's a a human generated or machine generated painting. Yeah, for for me the, the only difference is that uh, in the previous example, in that adversarial example, is that actually we don't touch the initial model. We actually know how it works, so we're able to generate this adversarial example. But here, uh, at the end, we're corrupting this model because this model is now trained on false data. So that's that's uh, the, the the main difference. And there is another example here of model corruption, which is called the backdoor attack. And where actually we're going to add to the training data some example um, that are um, actually um, that have a, um, a patch, like we said uh, earlier, a patch in this uh, in these images, and we associate a false label to this uh, to this image. So uh, this this um, this this model is trained with this uh, with this corrupted data, and then here when we have this uh, model in production, as soon as we have the same patch, this trigger on the input or in, in the input, we're going to have here an incorrect output, a specific uh, incorrect uh, output as it was trained on. And so there is also than... another yeah. I was going to say, rather than add yeah. pixels that make your cat appear as guacamole, you take all your cat pictures and you save them as guacamole. Actually, what you're going to do is uh, like uh, add a very small uh, green uh, square on the image and associate uh, these uh, this images with, uh, with uh, wolf or guacamole. And then even if you have as an input a uh, picture of a dog, that you have this small green square, it's going to output uh, guacamole. So that's uh, that's the uh, the backdoor attack. And another thing I think it's um, important to be aware of is that um, sometimes in a deep learning algorithm we we use pre-trained algorithm. That's um, what we call a transfer learning. And the same thing as our input data, we have to be aware. Um, we have to make sure that. We're going to pick this pre-trained model from reliable sources. We have uh, what we call uh, now model zoos, um, uh, so zoo of uh, models where you you can go and pick a pre-trained model. But we have to be aware that this model can be corrupted. So we have to make sure that we are uh, going to, to pick this pre-trained model. Um, we do that uh, in order to. Um, to uh, to uh, uh, to reduce the the time of computation, um, but we have to make sure that we are picking this model from reliable sources. Sounds good. So that's uh, that were the, the the four type of of threats uh, I wanted uh, to talk about uh, today. Now those are fascinating. I mean, those are all important things to remember. Uh, too often we get into the DevOps model and the DevSecOps model. We don't think about where that data we're collecting goes and how we want to use it. But the next steps are, are using it and integrating all those different streams together. Uh, and I think we've got your contact information up at the end again, right? I thought you had one more slide. Yes, exactly. If folks want to get a hold of you. Yes, so um, I can be contacted on uh, Twitter or LinkedIn. So it's my name, um, followed by last name, Sabi Shayeb. Uh, if uh, if uh, folks uh, want to, to want to contact, yeah. So Sebi, this has been really interesting. Thanks for being here today. We really appreciate you coming out and talking about all these great things. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, so I'm always 
interested in doing other stuff, even though we've got a DevSecOps and MLOps. And it was worthwhile. Hopefully people get the same things out of it. And hopefully we'll both be in the chat room uh, as we do this a little bit later in the month. Uh, and things will go well. Any final thoughts? Any final comments? Yeah, so actually I wanted also to talk about uh, defenses, but maybe we can talk about that uh, another time. But yeah, uh, if I have one piece of advice to give to, to the data scientists or DevOps uh, people watching this is that the first step for defense is be aware of the threats first. Um, so just by being aware of this, we can uh, take um, good, good defense uh, strategies at least. So thank you very much for well, having Thank me. you for being here.